We know that it is you, Lord, that our hearts long for. And you give us those beautiful things that provide for us the comfort that we need, Lord, and we thank you for that. We're so mindful of the, the, the opportunities that we have to be good stewards with all the blessings that you give. Lord, I just pray that you would help us as your people turn our hearts towards the work that needs to be accomplished, Lord. That you would move from, uh, remove us from the, the, the places that we've gotten a little too comfortable, Lord, and draw us heavenward. Draw us towards your kingdom and the work that you desire to be accomplished. So often, Lord, as you walked this earth, you saw people harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then, Lord, you've given us all that we need through the gospel, through your love, through your mercy and grace that was in evidence at a place called Calvary. And so, Lord, we just turn our hearts towards you and the sacrifice that you made to bring us home.
by his wounds I've been set free by his blood I've been redeemed the great divide he crossed for me oh praise the God of Calvary your cross is all all I need to see. Praise the God of Calvary. Thank you, Jesus. may be seated. Last week as we departed, I gave it out uh, a little piece of paper that was for something that we want to do next week and something that we want to continue to do throughout the year. And it's, it's in celebration or it's, it's observance of something that was brought to my attention that I think is worth uh, our attention. And it's called... Uh, Okay, I know the boss part, so it's back. I was thinking, bless our school Sunday. That's it, bless. So I'm thinking back to school, but it's bless our school Sunday, and we want to celebrate that next week uh, and gather around our, our teachers and our students and, and, uh, and, and maybe a few empty chairs because there's some, some teachers and students who are going to be represented by those empty chairs that aren't here yet. And so as part of bless our school Sunday, uh, Please watch this uh, uh, video as we prepare for next week. My name is Monique Taylor, and I've been involved in the Moms in Prayer ministry, oh my gosh, since my kids started kindergarten. And now I have one going into 11th grade and one going into 8th grade. And I'm the group leader for Mid-Pacific Institute. So Moms in Prayer um, is an interdenominational Christian organization that was started by a woman named Fern Nichols about 30 years ago. And um, it was basically out of the cry of her heart knowing that her two sons were going off to middle school and they live in a different world. We all live in a different world today. And she had a burden to just pray for these her boys that you know, they'd make good choices and know right from wrong and protect them from peer pressure. You know, as moms started hearing about, you know, the prayers that God was answering, the things that God was doing in their kids and in their schools, other groups started popping up. And it was from there that she got, started getting moms to pray about this being a national organization. And groups started praying in different states. And now we're in every state of, the na every state of our nation and um, Moms in Prayer is in over 140 countries. We can be busy doing a lot of things, but if God is not in it, and we're not praying to God and asking the Holy Spirit to intercede for God's will, then we're wasting a lot of efficiency and a lot of our own strength. So without prayer, I mean, you really can't accomplish God's will. I would say by being part of a Moms in Prayer group, um, you really are connecting with your kids. Uh, through God on a spiritual level every week. Um, a Moms in Prayer group meets once a week for like an hour, and it's just a time where you can pray with other moms for the burdens on your heart for your kids, for their friends, for their school, and you know, prayer is the most powerful thing we can do. going to need that. So next week, uh, and I have some more of these scripture prayers to pray for students, teachers, and school administrators, school support staff, as we continue to devote ourselves to prayer and being watchful 
and thankful for what God is doing in and through our community, in and through our church, in and through us. Okay. I've really enjoyed the last few months bringing something of ourselves, our story, and the story of God as we grew towards discovering what it meant to, in our relationship to God, develop our own personal doctrine, our, our own personal theology of what it means to be a worshiper. Because God calls us all to be worshipers. And uh, it is because of his grace that he has revealed himself and opened up every opportunity through every avenue that we have been walking, sometimes wandering, <laughs> where our story intersects with God's story and he calls us into becoming worshipers. I said one of the greatest things that I get to do is bring this thing down to a on Saturdays anyway, every, every Friday and Saturday I just soak in all the things that God has unpacked for me and, and kind of dovetail it into this, this thing called the Sunday morning address, which is what I've always called it, and uh, my wife makes a, 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 a kind of a joke out of it, that you're wearing a dress on Sunday? And I said, no, I'm having, I, I, never mind. <laughs> and this, this week, it seems, has been the most brilliant time with God, and yet the most um, I told I said before it's like this is the first time I ever felt like throwing up for before service <laughs> because of what God has laid on me to share and the beauty of it and and the, and probably it's because it's so personal for me that that God has brought me to 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 this place and this time because as we've been unpacking through the scriptures you know. That, that, that there's, because of our relationship to God, spiritual sacrifices that we're to offer. Uh, we've, been, we've been in 1 Peter 2 and, and talking about being a living stone, build, being built up into a spiritual house, being built into a priesthood set apart to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through, through Jesus. And we just sang that song. We just sang those words about what it means for us to, to know God through Jesus' work through what Jesus did at Calvary. And, and if that doesn't move you beyond comprehension, uh, it should. Because it's amazing. It's a miracle. It is a miracle that God has made us rightly related to him through Jesus Christ. And, and we should be uh, celebrating that. And I'll get to that in a minute because he, he started his covenant through Abraham that when he said he was going to be a blessing to all the peoples of the earth, this is what he was talking about, that he was going to be a blessing to all the peoples, through, that, that God was going to make through Abraham's seed a blessing to all the people of the earth. He was talking about Calvary. He was talking about, that's, that's an interesting tone. Hey, we're going to spend the weekend together. Are you going to bring that with you? We can have some fun with that. <laughs> Sorry, Bill. I love you, brother. We're going to have a great time this weekend. I connected with this, the covenant promise to Abraham through Jesus Christ, just like you have. Because if you are in Christ, then you are, then you are Abraham's seed. You are heirs to the covenant according to the promise that God gave to Abraham through Jesus Christ. That's what Paul tells the Galatians, right? So that's something worthy of celebrating. That's something worthy of praising. So we've been unpacking the, the, the sacrifices that we bring to God in light of God's work through Jesus at Calvary. And it begins with the praise, the fruit of our lips, being the acknowledging of his name. And we went to Hebrews 13, 15, that we were, are through Jesus then, continually offering up the sacrifice of praise, fruit of, fruit of the lips that acknowledge his name. This is a continuous act on our part that God has called us to, to do, to do. And, and we never get tired of it. We sing every Sunday. We sing every day. We praise him every moment. We praise him continuously in, in, in light of that scripture. And that leads us, it jumps right into the next one, in the compassionate caring for the needs of others in Hebrews 13, 16. There are people that God is concerned about, 
people that, that, that need to hear or experience the things that we have experienced through Jesus Christ, through his work at Calvary. And it's up to us to go meet those needs. And there is no greater time than the present time to be at work caring for the needs of others through, through the work of the, the body of Christ into places like Harvey, into places like where the fires that are going all around, the last I counted, there were 23 of them in Oregon. The whole West is on fire. Every, you don't have to look very far to see uh, a place where you can put your hand to work in, 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 in service to God, in service to the King. And sometimes it takes money, and, and we've learned to give. We talked about the sacrifice of giving, uh, Paul says to the uh, Philippians in Philippians 4.18, uh, how God is pleased with the financial offering as, as the Philippians worked with Paul, contributing their finances to his work for the gospel. So we have verbal praise, caring for those in need, and giving to c- Christian ministry as three parts of, of sacrifices that I would call a lifestyle of worship. Worship isn't just about music. It's about a lifestyle in response to the goodness of God through the cross of Jesus Christ to enable us to worship Him through praise, through caring in compassionate ways, and through giving. But there's one more, and this is why I told you I almost threw up. And you probably heard about it. It's in Romans 12. It's in Romans 12, 1 and 2 to be exact. And Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, ouch, by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, Val, if we could just go back one slide and just let that one hang there. That's, this is what we want to focus on today. By the mercies of God to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. The fourth new covenant sacrifice is the living or the giving of this thing we call a body, as a living sacrifice. So there, we have four. A lifestyle of worship that is pleasing to God consists of these four elements. Verbal praise, caring for those in need, financial support of Christian ministry, or some form of percentage, it's not a one-time deal, some form of percentage giving on a regular basis. If God is stirring your heart, to enter into a covenant agreement with him by faith to give to Christian ministry. Test him in this and you will be blessed. And you will have the testimony of everyone who's ever done it to say, you will be blessed. And I've heard churches, in fact, we did it in Brookings. uh, Test it for 90 days. If you don't feel feel that God has, uh, if you don't feel, try it for 90 days and if you ask for it, we'll give you your money back. Jim's not here. <laughs> I've heard it, and I've never heard anybody take that offer or respond to that in that way. I've never heard anybody come ask for their money back. That's what I need to say. I, got, I went way out on a limb there, thanks, but... <laughs> And then presenting our bodies as living sacrifices. Now that's pretty specific. That's pretty personal. Because, you know, what I do with this thing is my own business. And, and God, okay, God, I'll, I'll praise you. God, if I see a need, I can act on that. God, if, 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 if you ask me to, yeah, I can contribute a little bit towards this if I'm in agreement with what's going on there. But boy, you want all of me now? I'm not sure. I'm not sure where I stand on that. And God asks us, even if it's a little inconvenient, to let go and trust Him. And a lot of times it is inconvenient, isn't it? We've been talking about comfort earlier. It's like, oh, oh, do we grow when we're comfortable? 
or do we grow in the in the case or do we grow when we're a little bit stimulated and afflicted sometimes you got to prune sometimes you got to aerate the soil to get a plant to do what you need it to do right and god's not beyond pruning and god's not a, a beyond rending our hearts or or aerating the soil around us to dislodge us from whatever it is he needs to dislodge us from and there it is again therefore brothers in view of the mercies of god I urge you, I'm reading the CSB because I, I, I don't see the verse 1 up there again. Yeah, let's just leave that because I'll quote the CSB instead of the ESV. So leave that for me, would you? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. What are the mercies of God? Calvary. Calvary. Grace. His love. God continues. God continues to call us beyond our ability to comprehend even and stepping out in faith in response to his mercy, to his mercy. I left the segment here that could go it's called my story. And maybe you don't know, but it, because it is my story, I can share a little bit of it. And maybe you don't know uh, that I was born to a young girl who hadn't finished high school yet, who wasn't married, and she dropped out of high school and kept me. I could lose it right now because of that love that she had for me to do what she did in the midst of the day and time that she did it. And, and, and I love you, Mom. Thank you. And I remember moving a lot growing up in that circumstance. I remember having a stepdad at some point, and this was a big celebration for us, seemed like we didn't move quite so much. And I got into school, but I still, I think from the first grade, the second grade, the third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, I went to at least three different schools each year because we moved so much. Somewhere between the second grade and third grade, my mom got married, and I had a stepdad. I didn't like him very much, because he was different. He, he did things that, looking back, I'm not sure was right. But I, he did one thing that God used, and it happened somewhere in Grants Pass, Oregon, I don't know how, I don't know why, I just know that I was in a Sunday school class. And there was a Sunday school teacher, God bless you if you're teaching Sunday school. God bless you if you're ministering to kids. Because I'm a story of a kid who was blessed by someone in that position. And yes, she did say, is anybody here not saved? And I, of course, was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> So I got drugged to the altar that day to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And then I was standing in the back when the service was over, and I was intimidated, I was scared, I was confused, I didn't understand, but everybody was excited. And they said, did you get saved today? I sure hope so, because it sure seems like a big deal to you. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to fit in, and I don't remember how long we were there as part of that church. I know this. I remember potlucks. I remember endless sermons sitting right here. <laughs> I remember the pastor going, boys, because <laughs> me and my brother were acting a little rambunctious, and, 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 and I remember he had a flat top and a skinny tie, so that I could tell you kind of about what time it was in the, in the culture. <laughs> But I, never, I always felt loved. I remember potlucks. 
I remember food. I remember people. I remember faces. I remember watching people go to the altar and seeing peer, people with stained faces. You know, people that I thought were, were, were uh, you know, I didn't know what was going on. I don't know how many times we went to that church, but I do know this. My stepdad was never there. I don't remember my mom being there. I just remember me and my brother. And then we weren't going anymore. It's more of a memory. It's a distant memory that I can't put any context around. And I grew up wondering about Jesus because I heard about Jesus. And I remember the first time I picked up a Bible and I was hungry enough to read the stories of Jesus. And by then... I was in my 20s. It was amazing. I was receptive to it. And I liked it, but I was still doing my own thing. I was living my own, my own life. And then I got into a position where it seemed like the bottom completely dropped out. And the only thing that made me feel whole or comforted me was the Word of God. But even then, I don't know that if you ask me, were you saved at that young age when you got drugged? I don't know. I don't know what happened. I just know that I only felt peace. I only felt hope. I only felt comfort when I had my nose in the Psalms and I was reading the Psalms and I know God was talking to my heart. I was in and out of churches for like 15 years. Doing my best to raise kids. And I remember discovering Luke eleven thirteen, where it says, if you are evil... And know how to give good gifts to your kids? How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So I felt like, man, this Christian thing is nuts. I cannot do those things. I can't be, I don't feel like that. I can't, I can't, I can't walk that path. And I thought, well, something must be missing. So I don't know what it is, but God, if you'll give it to me, I'm going to ask him. And I started asking. And I think I spent five years agonizing in tears and in grief and in sorrow. I think I forgot to tell you about the part of growing up where all I understood was grief. All I understood was misery. All I understood was sorrow. All I understood was loss. And I found Jesus there. And I prayed for that Holy Spirit to come and to fill me and to give me a sense of hope. And I did my best to present my body as a living sacrifice. But man, it was an awful death. I was miserable. And I think I began to understand through my continual failings that I needed God to do something in me that I couldn't do. And it was only by God doing it that anything was going to get done. And I saw that passage that said, being transformed by the renewal of this. So I got a brilliant idea and I went to a pastor, and I said, I want you to anoint my, my mind for healing because this thing is not working for me. I keep failing. I'm not thinking right. I'm not thinking in a way that lives the life of victory. And I be, think I begin to understand, and I can't honestly tell you that I stand right here and, and, and that it makes sense to me, but the concept of this new birth thing is that something has to come from outside and come enter into us 
And all my thinking was is that I could pull myself up by my own bootstraps and do it if I just tried harder. And as it goes back to the story of God and the evidence of his eternal promises to Abraham, to Moses, to the prophets, to Ezekiel, that he said, I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new spirit. I began to discover what was right and what was true and what was good. And I realized somehow that he was asking me to do that first thing that I've been talking about. Bring him a sacrifice of praise. I was so hurt. I was so filled with grief. I was angry. Because I didn't have a chance ever to know my father. I never called anybody dad. And that made me so mad. I didn't realize it. That God at that point was asking me, Thank him for it. That was nuts. But that was the threshold for me. And I'm not saying that's right for you. I'm not saying that's right for anybody. That's where I had a breakthrough here. That's where I had a transformation here. I started to acknowledge that God loved me enough that he put me in that position. He gave me the mom that he gave me. And when I started thanking him for it, the grief and the sorrow and the anger started to dissipate and I began to experience that thing called new birth new life a new heart and that's the beginning of my walk as a disciple as a follower of Jesus Christ 20 some years maybe 30 some years I I, I can't tell you how many exact of misery ticked over into victory on October the 15th of the year 2000. When I went to the altar and I gave my life, I gave my money, I gave my heart, I became what I call a living sacrifice. God, whatever you want, whatever you want. And he reached down into the muck and the mire, and you've seen the picture on my wall in the office there of Jesus reaching down to pull Peter out from underneath the waves. That's where God found me that day, under the waves. God has more in mind for us than just to escape the consequences of sin and death. I think my story is a little too long. I'll save that for some other time, Lord will it? Because I need to tell you another story about another boy who lived a different life. His name was John. John grew up in the faith. John was baptized very young. And he was strictly educated. He was so strictly educated that this is a concept that I can't comprehend is that mealtime was mealtime. That's when you ate. You don't eat any other time, and you eat what's on your plate. He was strictly educated to the point that he believed that the baptism that he had when he was young would cover him as long as he was obedient in keeping God's commands. He lived until uh, he went away to school, secondary school, And he believed that while he was at secondary school, his parents' authority wasn't quite so near, so he got a little careless at times. But nothing too scandalous in the world's eyes, anyhow. Because after all, he had disciplined in himself the habits of reading scripture and praying every morning and every evening. And he'd seen that at this school there were others who were far worse than he was. So he hoped that his practice would save him. At the age of 22, his family pressed him to accept what he calls holy orders. 
So he went on to finish his higher education at Oxford, guarding himself against all forms of sin. It was there that he began to pray a similar prayer to what I pray, something for some kind of inward holiness in relation to God. He had absolutely no doubts he was a good Christian. He was visiting prisons. He was ministering to the poor and to the sick and eventually felt like he needed to be fasting two times a week. He did everything he could to diligently avoid any form of sin. If there was a form of self-denial that was in keeping with the law of God, he did it. But there was a problem. After an upbringing of that, and being somewhere in his late 20s, ordained into the ministry, serving in the church. He felt absolutely no comfort or assurance that God found him acceptable. He had attempted to go on a mission, a missionary journey. And it was on the way back from that journey that he felt as if he were completely a complete failure as a minister. Oh, he had converted the heathens, but not having his own assurance or comfort of faith, he asked and wrote in his diary, who shall convert me? <laughs> Who will deliver me from my evil heart? He recognized through applying some specific terms, some specific proofs that brought to light his own behavior where he really was. He says, I had a fair summer religion and I believe just fine while there's no danger. But as soon as death comes to look me in the face, my spirit is troubled. He associated the spirit of trouble with unbelief. He felt his unbelief in those circumstances was having no faith at all in the work of Christ. He said, faith in Christ would prevent my heart from being troubled. I could not be troubled if I truly believed in God and rightly believed in Christ. He recognized in himself, in the moments of trouble, it revealed to him he had no faith. That's pretty strict. That's pretty high standard. But to add to that, he carried in himself a great sense of pride in his accomplishments. He had a a great, terrific sense of security in what he had accomplished through his ministry. But yet he found that he thought he had something that he didn't really have. And he wrote, I knew it then. I knew then at that point, everything I had done was as if I was building on the sand. He recognized this in the fact that he would cry out to God when it was difficult, but in the moments of calm, he didn't need to. He recognized it especially in the way that he spoke and related in his relationships to others. And the times when he would use words that did not edify or build up. And it was particularly evident in, the re- in revealing his heart in the way that he acted towards his enemies. And God brought him to a point of repentance. Of renewal. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Save me or I will die. Save me with such a faith that I have peace in the midst of life 
as well as in the midst of death, that there's no difference. Save me that as humility, humility may fill my heart from this hour forever, piercing and uninterrupted. Save me that I might know I am standing on the rock, no matter where I'm at. Our daughter was displaced by Irma. She's probably just letting me know that they're okay. Save me by such a recollection that as I cry out in every moment, especially when it's calm, to give me faith, give me humility, give me steadiness, give me sobriety of the Spirit, Avoiding as fire every word that tends not to edify and never speaking of any who oppose me or sin against God without all my sins laid out in front of me. He says, save me, for if the gospel is true, I know I'm safe to seek you He presented himself in Romans 1, a living sacrifice. I'm going to read it again. By the mercies of God to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Can you leave that up? Can you just leave that up there? Thank you. The basis of our, the the response of our lives in in view of God's mercy is always to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, an acceptable sacrifice, a holy sacrifice. Because he calls us to be set apart for him and his purposes alone. And all the promises of God through the covenant with Abraham through the deliverance of the Israelites out of Egypt, through the continual raising up of judges to lead the the people of Israel out of bondage, to the grand time of the kings, grand and not so grand, through the time of exile, through the time of the rebuilding, God continues to make a way for his people to come back to him. And it all points towards Calvary. The ancient, the Old Testament lifestyle of worship was based on a service that centered on the sacrifice. I ask again, Romans 12, 1. I need it. Thank you. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Worship in the Old Testament gathered around sacrifice. Leviticus describes a series of sacrifices that were to be offered leading up to Reconciliation. What does it mean to be reconciled? It means to be rightly restored or to brought back to the right place. Leviticus describes the sacrifices that were to take place after reconciliation. The sacrifices made before reconciliation was to obtain Reconciliation. The sacrifice offered after reconciliation was to serve and celebrate it. And that's the kind of sacrifice that Paul is talking about here. 
I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, by the work of Christ on the cross, the first sacrifice, to obtain reconciliation, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, here we come in response to God's mercy, the second sacrifice which serves and celebrates reconciliation to God, being brought back, being put in the right place. The whole idea of the first few chapters of Romans up to this point in 12.1 was that the sacrifice offered by God for sin was Jesus for the transgression of all, for, the, for all of mankind. That is the mercy of God. The practical application is right here in Romans 12.1. It corresponds to the second sacrifice which is celebrating the act of God through consecration, celebrating the pardon that has been received, celebrating the communion that has been obtained as a, uh, the relationship with God has been reestablished through Christ for all believers, for all who put their faith in Jesus. The sacrifice offered by God in the person of Christ should now find a response in the believer who completely consecrates themselves towards intimacy and communion with God. Present yourself. Consecrate yourself. Put your body as a living sacrifice at the disposal of God. That's what he's asking. Consecrating ourselves is a gut-wrenching process. It's an uncomfortable process, but there's a peace that comes through the crisis and the process because we recognize how the body becomes an instrument through which human service, human acts of worship are yielded to, to God. Living organisms grow. If it's not growing, it's probably dead. Are we growing? Are we a living sacrifice consecrated to God? Are we comfortable? Are we uncomfortable? Let me ask you this. Is the enemy harassing you? Because if he's not, you might be a little too comfortable. And you might ask God, why is the enemy leaving me alone? Is there something that you need me to do in this issue of presenting myself to you? Holy. Are we willing to be holy? Are we willing to be set apart? Are we willing to be completely cleansed? Are we willing to have freedom from the power of sin? Paul warned Timothy about having a form of godliness that lacks power. Power, the power of God. Are you willing to be filled by the Holy Spirit and to love God with all your heart, mind, strength, so that the holiness of God can be manifested in the living sacrifice of 
bodies hard at it for God. Can we stand together? This is our chance to just listen to him and maybe step out in our own discomfort in the full recognition that it's